I got shot. I got shot. I was shot. On February 28th of 2017, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. A little patch. To me, this day represents the knowledge that I now have of how fragile life is. The bullet is four years old now. Here I am. Perfectly fine. I almost lost my life. Now is the time for me to live in more than I've ever lived before. I am happy that I'm still alive. Kill the intro, sis. You know she's not your average show, not your average show. It's been five years since I got shot. The bullet has not moved. We are good. Everything's under control. But I always sit down with you guys, with myself, and have a reflection moment, a rebirth day confessional, 15 minutes of me just ranting, thinking about what has happened five years ago, what has happened every single year subsequently. It's not often that you get to talk to somebody who's been through a near-death experience. And I always forget that I've gone through one because it's like life goes on. You, you keep going, you move on. I definitely never wanted to sit in the victim space, even though I was clearly a victim of a crime, not targeted, but they were targeting someone. It just so happened to be me. I've made videos about how it happened. Quick recap, if you don't know, I was in Rio last day of carnival, February 28th. I was 25 years old and I was with my family. My uncle and aunt were driving me to a party because that's what you do in Carnaval. And it's funny because now looking back, I think about how I felt pressured to be in Brazil because I felt like it would make me more Brazilian to be there during Carnaval. It's not that I necessarily wanted to go. I almost wanted to go just to prove to myself and to anybody who ever asked that I was Brazilian because yes, I've gone through Carnaval. I don't really care for big crowds. I don't love street parties. I didn't really need to go to Carnaval. But I guess I did need to go to Carnaval because this all happened. And it's, it, while it's like been a ridiculously crazy thing that happened to me, I feel like it's added value in so many ways. It's like when you turn tragedy into triumph and wisdom and every year when I have these moments of, of reflection I'm, I'm always aware of like damn this is really a time for me to reset and I wouldn't have had this rebirth day had this not happened to me anyways I was in the car we were driving and down the street where I should have been raised two men were blocking the street waiting to rob the next car that came down the street and it just so happened to be ours my uncle kept driving because he has lived in Brazil all his life and has gotten shot himself because a robber wanted him to never forget him, even though my uncle had handed over the documents that he had asked for. So he knew malice, he knew viciousness. So he was not willing to take a chance with his wife and his son and his niece, me, by stopping the car and trying to make nice with the criminals. And we kept driving away and they started shooting the car and they shot nine times. And in this nine time gun shootout, I don't even know if it was nine times, it sounded like, I think they counted nine bullet holes in the car. But in one of these pops, I felt heat in my back and lost my breath and put my right hand on my back. I'll never forget this moment. I put it on my back like this and, and felt this like dangerously mysterious heat like I've never felt before in my body. If I can describe it to you, it's almost like every thing in my body went to that area to try to save itself. And this is when I said words I thought I would never say in my entire life. Eu acabei de levar um tiro nas costas. I just got shot in the back. And this is when my uncle and aunt went into superhero mode and got me to a hospital within less than three minutes. They were swerving because the guys never stopped shooting. Till this day, they've never caught the criminals, we filed a police report. I'll never see these people. They had motorcycle helmets on. They are very much still roaming the streets of Rio. I get shot, I pull myself out of the car, glass is all over my hair and I'm just in shock. But also I, I look to my left and I start laughing partially because I was in shock, partially because I almost lost my life. But really I started laughing because the first bullet that entered the car would have gone through my head if I were sitting where I should have been sitting, but instead I was sitting in the middle seat, not wearing a seatbelt, very unlike me, but it saved my life this day, leaned forward telling a story. So storytelling actually saved my life and 
so did every millisecond, tiny centimeter that would have completely changed my ability to do this, to walk around, to do jumping jacks. Like the bullet could have easily been one centimeter deeper or to the left or to the right and it would have hit a critical nerve that would have affected my mobility. And as somebody who loves mobility, who loves walking around, exploring, getting on planes, I always love to revisit the fact that I almost lost that ability. You know how when you have a sore throat or a runny nose or like an annoying cough, you always in that moment where you're like snotting, you're like, oh man, I wish I didn't have this. You know, it's funny, we always want health when we don't have it, but what if we just always appreciated health even when we weren't sick? So that's kind of what the bullet has done for me. It's like, even if nothing's wrong, I will randomly just be grateful for my ability to walk. Every time I work out, when it's painful, when it hurts, when I feel my muscles ripping apart because they're expanding, I'm grateful because that means if it hurts, my body is working, it's alive. So one of the lessons that I've carried with me throughout that's gotten definitely more profound. It's this gratitude without the need to be grateful. What I don't want is to be on my deathbed being like, man, I wish I did this, this, and that. Or what I don't want is to have a sore throat and be like, I should have done all of my talking before when I didn't have a sore throat. What I want to carry forever is this exercise of like active gratitude. In my journaling club, I always put prompts. There are prompts on there, like 700 plus prompts on Joe Club's Instagram, but what I always, put as a recurring prompt, and I do this on purpose, it's make a list of everything you're grateful for. Make a gratitude list. This is not news, I'm not the first person to talk about this. There's science that backs the idea of being grateful and how it boosts your mood and overall just like attracts better things to you. But when it comes to my physical body and the abilities that I have, I'm always just checking myself like, damn y'all, let's have a little dance party here because we can. And I'm this close to not being able to, so I'm gonna do it. Another theme this year that's come up for me with the bullet in mind too, it's like this idea of uh, life's fragility. I think with what's going on in the world right now, the war in Ukraine, people are asking themselves empathetically, what would we do if this were us? What would we do if this were our country? Bravery is being redefined in Ukraine right now with these men and women who are staying, average citizens, learning from the military, taking guns, protecting their freedom and their lives and their families. War has happened obviously, but like in our lifetime, this is a really pinnacle moment in history. And when I think about how even if you're not in Ukraine, even if you're not being directly affected, even if you know no one who is going through this crisis, we're all connected. We're all seeing these posts on social media. We're seeing the damage that's being caused. And while it's my rebirthday, just because it, like the time of year, February and March, it's always this time where I'm taking inventory of my life. I think the world is in this moment as well. The world is asking about their values. It's asking about what are we willing to fight for? It's asking, we're asking ourselves things like, what would we do if this were us? How are we gonna help these people? How do we protect ourselves and our values and our freedoms and and our abilities to, to live life fully? So when it comes to this next chapter of not only my life, but of the world's life, I guess my thought is, or my like hope is that we're checking these things regularly, not just when a war breaks out, that we're asking how can we help our fellow brothers and sisters? How can we like be of service to others? How can we remind people of life's fragility so we can enjoy the shit out of the moment now? Because that's really what it is. Like on that hospital bed, I was cracking jokes and I say this every time because I'm like, people were, were saying like, Joe, you shouldn't be cracking jokes. And I'm like, why I'm not dead yet? Shit. The point of life is to be enjoyed. It's to grow close to people. It's to find happiness. And right now times are grim. It's really hard to find reasons to smile. But when I woke up on the anniversary, I remembered that there is a big reason to smile and that's I can walk. I can freaking walk. There's so many other reasons to smile, but like starting with the basics. And so I guess if we train our minds to be grateful and to be aware of the fragility of all of it, we're, we're able to kind of like use our time on this earth wiser, which brings me to lesson number three. This year, I've definitely stepped into more of my like authenticity of growing my knowledge, of having deep enriching conversations and of turning that into something I can share on the internet. Cause I had always been like this offline, but it wasn't the brand. It wasn't what got views. So I just like never did it. I would do it 
offline. And then I had a persona, Joe is bubbly fun girl, which I am that as well. But like your girl is a geek when it comes to neuroscience, when it comes to digesting psychology, looking at the past and thinking about the future and just getting to know people on these deep levels. And I'm finally doing that. I'm doing that on my podcast every week and it's been the most meaningful thing I've done. So it's like, I don't know, we don't have that much time. So if we have this limited time, do the things that you wanna do because even if it doesn't blow up right away, even if it doesn't have a million views or a million subscribers or a million followers, the value is in that it means something to you and that, when something means something to you, that's worth spending your time on. That's sustainable. Because whether or not people are watching, I'm having deep conversations with people. I might as well slap a microphone on and share it with the world and maybe everyone else can gain value. So it's almost like a selfish way to kill two birds with one stone or feed two birds with one scone. It's the, the idea that like, we really don't have that much time. So how can you be efficient with coupling the things that you really love, the things that you do no matter what? I think about journaling and I started thinking about this channel. I haven't posted much and I'm asking myself why. And it's because I think for the last chapter of my YouTube career, I would make videos specifically for YouTube. And it felt like I wasn't really doing it for me anymore. It was just like, damn, why am I posting this just so that I can beat my last video? That sucks. And then I started making these visual journals, which I have finished a bunch and I can't wait to share them with you. But it's like, yeah, I've journaled my whole life and it wasn't for anyone else. I journaled because it's something that I've done for me. So what if I turn this channel into sort of like a visual journal? Because whether or not people watch, I will get the value in it because when I'm 80 years old, if I live that long, inshallah, I'll be able to look back at these pieces of videos that mark these beautiful moments in my life that I never want to forget. That's more valuable than any amount of views. So it's thinking about like intentionality of this time, like using this time wisely. There are a bajillion quotes on this, like this is not news again, I'm not saying mind blown new information, but it's like a checkpoint every time the anniversary comes around. And for that, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that it happened. Something else that's definitely changed and gotten louder and louder and harder and harder to ignore is this idea of taking care of my health and my body and looking at my body as this vehicle that allows me to walk this earth and do the crazy things I love to do. Again, there are two ways you can look at this. You can look at the health and wellness and workouts and fitness in the, the physical way of like, you want a sexy body, you want to look good for hot back summer. Cool, there's motivation there. But for me, it's much deeper, literally deeper. It's the muscles, it's the organs. When I got shot, the doctors told me that my muscles were strong because they absorbed the shock of, of the impact of the bullet coming in. And they asked me if I worked out and I had coincidentally been training, 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 training as if I were supposed to be an Olympian. Little did I know I was training for this moment. Two things in that lesson, we should always be training in preparation, even if there's nothing to prepare for immediately because that opportunity will come or that thing that will happen will happen and you'll be prepared. But also just like, damn, our bodies are dope. They're also super fragile, but they're also super dope. And so what an unfortunate decision it is to feed it with crap. I love my indulgences, don't get me wrong. Your girl loves chocolate, wine, alcohol in general. I love having a nice cocktail. I love coffee. I love eating foods from different countries. Like part of my life is that, right? It's like going abroad and finding new foods and trying it and whatever. And I love that, but it's also like moderation. I can do that and then I can go vegan for six months, which is what I'm doing now. Realizing that everything that you put inside of your body has a direct effect on the output of how you're feeling, what you're thinking, your mood, your fatigue, other things like sleep, right? Like, why am I not sleeping correctly? Right now I'm on a caffeine cleanse. I took caffeine out of my system altogether. I really didn't realize how much of my life revolved around coffee. Went from zero to 100 or 100 to zero. And all of this, I feel like the older I get, the more I'm like learning about gut health and I'm learning about the correlation between your brain function and your gut and the things that you consume. That's become interesting to me and I think it's important. So many diseases are linked to your nutrition and if your body is diseased and if you feel weak, you're unable to prepare for the things that could happen. That's a huge, huge, huge lesson that I feel like is super overlooked. Like we're always thinking about these diet crazes. No one's ever talking about the inside out aspect of it that like your body will shut down eventually 
there's no insurance policy on it. The least we could do is take it for its maintenance checks, regular workouts, cardio, nutrition, getting blood work done to see what's good for your body, what you're lacking. Like all of that has now become a part of my life. And sometimes I fall off, I'm human. But this time of year, especially it's like, am I staying nutritious? Am I staying on top of my fitness? And if I'm not, I get back on the horse. And the fifth lesson on the fifth anniversary of me getting shot is how important connections are. Connections are everything. Connections are from the minute we are born and we open our eyes to the minute that we die, they are vital to our existence. So many people like to say that they're independent and independence is amazing, I'm independent myself. Make no mistake though, I rely heavily on my support of friends, on my support system of friends and family and I've become closer to those people that I know have proven to me that they're there for me. And that's a two way street. It's like you have to extend a hand or someone extends their hand and symbiotically you dance and when you look at the last five years, 10 years, you see who's still there. You see who's checking in with you whether you're hot or not. You see who's reaching out whether there's some news or not. And those are the people that I've poured my time and energy into. That's a big reason why I bought my house in Connecticut so that I could go home and be with my mom whenever I'm home and not traveling. And I also wanted to see my niece and nephews grow up because yes, I have this beautiful life traveling, but what good is it if I'm completely disconnected from everyone that I care about? So I made it a priority to make it work. It's like, it's not easy. That's obviously not my end goal. I'm turning 30 this year. I'm not gonna live with my mom, but it's, I'm still gonna have that house. And that was a big investment, a chunk of money that I spent to basically say to myself and to my family, like, I wanna have a relationship with you. I don't need to be in Connecticut. I want to be, and it's changed everything. The relationships that I have, the, the stories that I hear about my family from my mom, the little things that I see from my niece and nephews as they're growing, my relationship with my siblings, just getting to see us becoming the adults in the dynamic, that's so special that I can't imagine going down this life without carving that out. It's funny because the years seem to go quicker and quicker. Every video comes around faster and faster. These videos are a great marker of time for me. And if we don't carve out what is important to us and if we don't make that priority, it will never, or maybe some sometimes it will, but most likely it will never actually take its place in our lives the way that we want it to. If you want to have a more nutritious life, that's you, that's on you. You have agency. You can make decisions to choose healthier options. If you want better family relationships, of course, relationships are two way street because you need to have reciprocation, but you can be the first one to extend your hand. My sister and I talk about this on my podcast. We did an episode where we talked about like family dynamic and how things weren't always great. And then I started a group chat, like something as simple as just having a place for all of us to connect. And I started texting the family saying, hey guys, I'm taking off from here. Hey guys, I landed here. No one would care. No one would ask. It's unsolicited information. But that was me being like, hey guys, I want to have this connection with you. And ever since then, the group chat's been popping and the relationships have been growing over time. But again, if you don't sit down with yourself and think, what are my values? Like, what do I want? What's up? You don't even know where to start to plot these things that you can actually make happen in your life. For me, connections are everything. This is why the podcast has been really beautiful because I've been able to not only interview people that I've had connections with, but make new connections with people that are amazing and have so much to offer. That's also why I've been a lover of love. I've had several romantic relationships. And when I think about romance, I'm like, damn, I don't want to invest time in relationships that aren't mature enough to remain in contact afterwards if both parties agree. I think I've graduated from the era of flings. I've graduated from the era of like games. Relationship wise, I'm ready to build. I'm ready to connect. I'm ready to evolve and grow together. And this isn't just romantically. This is with my friends too. Everybody in my life has their place. This is how it is. I look at the relationships in my life like shelves. It's like who deserves a place on the shelf? Sometimes people are on higher shelves, higher priority. Sometimes they go into this, you know, like a shelf that's a little bit neglected, but overall everybody's on the wall and they're shelved and we're there and we're together. There's a dance of relationships. But as long as everybody that I care about is on my wall of shelves, I'm happy. And sometimes I'm like, damn, I gotta pick up that relationship. I haven't talked to that person in a long time, but that matters to me. Because when it's all said and done, it's, it's the memories. It's the memories. When I was laying down in that hospital bed, looking at the plain ceiling tile, I was thinking about people that I loved. Memories. I was trying to 
sip in all of the goodness just in case because I didn't know if I was going to get paralyzed. I didn't know if I was going to die. It was truly a question mark because when I got to the hospital with glass on my head, blood coming out of my back, the nurses said that the doctors were on strike and that I would have to lay down and wait for the doctor to come in the next morning at 8 a.m. This was around 10 p.m. So I had to wait around 12 hours to know my fate, to see the results of the tests. That night lasted a hundred years because I was reliving not only what I've already lived, but what I could have lived. It's like when you have a near-death experience, if you're conscious and you're awake to kind of think about what's happening to you, you, you think about everything that's happened, all the people in your life, all of the good, all the bad, all the people that you should have been nicer to, all of the conversations that you should have had, all of the I'm sorry's you should have said, which sucks. So there's that too, like having a near death experience makes you treat people better because you have more of a sense of urgency because you're aware that you don't have forever because you could turn the corner. That's it, it's done. But then on the other side, you think about the potential for all this life that you could still live and primitively humans have a need to survive. This is why adrenaline courses through our body. We have a need to survive because we have a need to connect. We have a need to be a part of a tribe. We have a need to love. So if we keep that top of mind, I think we would all be a little bit more kind to each other and to ourselves and to realize that no matter how different the person is, maybe they speak a different language. Maybe they were raised in a different country. Maybe they have a different skin color than you, different sexual orientation, different gender identity. At the core, all human beings want the same thing. We want to be cared for. We want to be safe. We want to be loved. If everyone knew that and lived their lives with those principles top of mind, there would be no war. There would be no violence. There would be no crimes that would hurt other people. Because at the end of the day, you just want to be nurtured and taken care of. So to end on a positive note, if you're watching this video, it means that you're alive. <sighs> Take in that air, sip in that opportunity. Even though times are grim right now, like the world is suffering. There's a lot to not smile about because of war, because of climate change, because of COVID-19. I get it and I'm with you and it's been hard for me. But for me, knowing that I woke up today with legs that walked, was already a win. And maybe the lesson here is just to go back to the basics. There's a lot of work we all need to do, but it starts with the simple things. It starts with the gratitude. It starts with the empathy. It starts with the awareness. It starts with the evolution, the interest, the curiosity, the desire to get to know someone else's language, the desire to get to know someone else's story, to grow your empathy and, and treat others with more compassion because we're all connected whether we believe it or not. Everything that you do to hurt someone will come back to you in some way. It's it's all connected. This is this lifetime is connected. I am praying for team humanity. I'm super sad. Click in the description box below. I've listed some resources about what's happening right now in the world if you need any additional resources and also uh, ways to donate to different organizations to help the people of Ukraine. And comment below, what does this time mean to you? Do you have a rebirth day? And what are the lessons that you've learned going through something difficult in your life that's made you stronger? How do we transform tragedy into triumph? For more of me, I've been posting weekly podcast episodes, It's Not Your Average Joe, on any major podcast platforms. And I think I'm actually gonna start posting the video episodes here uh, because I've filmed them, so why not, you know? And thank you guys so much. I'm gonna end this video with like a smile. They say if you smile, it scientifically makes you happy. <sighs> Bye. Is this creepy? A little. I'm doing this because I can. <laughs> Let's check out how the bullet's looking this year. There she is. Five years old today. <sighs> Thank you for watching. I'll be back soon.